Science has everything that makes for good drama. Intrigue, passion, agony, ecstasy, high stakes, big dreams, sometimes even romance. If science illuminates the way the world works and theater illuminates the way people work, aren't they a perfect match? I've spent much of my life in the theater as an actor at first and then also as a director and writer. And I like to describe my profession as that of theater maker. I also happen to have a lot of friends who are scientists. And I like their different perspectives. I like hearing about all the fascinating things they're working on. Well, I find them fascinating when I make them explain them to me in a way that I can understand. So, I've always wondered, why don't we see more of their stories on stage? Like we see political stories on stage. Lots of plays are about politics or world affairs. Why not more plays about science? When I was at the University of California, we started an international script competition for the best new play about science and technology. This is what we learned from the competition. A majority of the plays that we got were pervasively against science and technology. One script we received dealt with a dangerous creature that was half man, half kangaroo. I mean, who wouldn't pay good money to see Manaroo? We also received a lot of biographies and histories, and some of them were extremely good, but very few of them really used science and technology to their full extent. So around this time, a friend told me that many accidental discoveries in science are the fundamental cause of scientific breakthroughs. Pfizer, a drug company, was working on a drug for angina, a heart condition, and the drug didn't work for angina, but it turns out that the users experienced some, I would say, exciting results. <laughs> Penicillin, maybe one of the most important accidental discoveries ever, was found when a less than meticulous Alexander Fleming came back from a two-week vacation, found a petri dish of cultures with mold on them, and noticed that the moldy areas were bacteria-free. Well, it's true, though, that not all accidental discoveries have had happy endings. Scientists were investigating a nutritional supplement for premature infants, and instead they came up with Olestra, a zero-calorie fat substitute that left some feeling, well, empty. <laughs> the idea that accidental discoveries were a fundamental part of science was very compelling. My friend explained that experiments can fail in all sorts of ways. You run an experiment and, let's say, it doesn't work. Or it works, but the data is incomprehensible. Or maybe there's this one tiny little blip on the data that seems like it has nothing to do with what you're studying, but it's very suggestive. Well, a scientist doesn't just throw that out, but they study the blip and see where it leads them. They give over to the process itself and follow where it takes them. And the riskier the work, the greater the chances of discovering something new and interesting and unexpected. Well, this struck me as extremely interesting. And while all of these ideas were going around, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could create theater 
that focused on the process itself, just like science. Would that lead to more new and interesting discoveries in the arts? Could we somehow apply the model of doing science to making theater that was about science? Well, while all these ideas were fermenting, I happened to see an outstanding play by a gifted Quebecois theater and filmmaker named Robert Lepage. It was called The Far Side of the Moon. I had never seen anything like this before in my life. Technology was wholly integrated into this play in such a way that if you took away the technology, there'd be no play, just as if you took away the actors in dialogue, there'd be no play. Well, thanks to the generosity of Robert Lepage and his company, Ex Machina, I was able to witness and extensively research his creative process. Driven by all of these ideas coming together, the Stage Lab was created to develop new theater work inspired by science and technology, and to explore telling those stories in new ways by using technology in the staging of our productions. Now, these are not science lectures disguised as plays. These are emotionally engaging, entertaining stories that just happen to be about science. We want people to have an experience, an emotional experience that makes them laugh or, or moves them somehow, because it's that visceral experience that gets people interested in science, technology, and theater. We begin working by choosing a scientific topic that we want to explore, and then we look for the emotional essence, a metaphor for that science. We then construct a personal story around that emotional essence, a, a personal parallel to the science, and then we integrate the science story and the personal story. Take DNA, for example. What are some metaphors for DNA? The passing down of traits, identity, who we are. These are things that you can hang a story on. In our lab now, Graduate students and undergraduate students are working on a new theater piece about DNA folding, as it's often referred to. Large amounts of DNA have to fold up very tightly in order to fit into a cell. And also, it's the very specific way and very complex way in which the DNA folds that plays a crucial role in ultimately determining how that cell will function. Will it be a brain cell? Will it be a heart cell? Well, the same can be said for our identities. They're very specific, very complex, and they have a great deal to do with how we function. We begin by working around a table with computers and books, and people bring in all sorts of resources around which we improvise and in order to fuel our discussions. Now, a resource can be anything. It could be a newspaper article, a research paper, which is where we got the idea for DNA folding, a film clip, a photograph, a personal anecdote, anything, as long as it has something to do with the topic at hand. So students were bringing in all sorts of resources around this DNA project, and they brought in all sorts of things about folding. Folding clothes to pack a suitcase, folding laundry, folding pastry dough. And then one of the students offered up the resource of kimono folding, or kimono dressing, as it's more accurately called. Now, kimonos, it turns out, are very difficult to put on. That involves many intricate steps of folding and tying. And it often requires a licensed professional kimono dresser to assist. Kimonos are handed down from generation to generation, and they're typically never altered. So when you inherit the kimono, it will be folded up and tied in such a way to make it fit your body. There's even a special way to fold a kimono for storage so that it doesn't wrinkle. In our lab now, these students are working on a story about DNA folding, that's integrated with a complex personal story about Japanese identity, heritage, and culture. This is the work that we're engaged in now in the Stage Lab at the University of Chicago's Institute for Molecular Engineering. This is where we have our new home. 
Our work process is based on that of experimental science and Robert Lepage, and we work with scientists, engineers, professional artists, and students from all disciplines. All of our work is developed improvisationally, and each improvisation is treated like an experiment. We're constantly weighing and examining what the experiments tell us. And then, just as the scientists analyze their results and use that to revise an experiment, we change the circumstances of a scenario and improvise again. In our lab, everybody collaborates in the same room at the same time from the very beginning. Suppose, for example, the lighting designer is there, improvising along with the actors, and in response to something the actors do, the lighting designer instinctively throws up a panel of light, and it falls on the stage in such a way as to suggest a doorway. And let's say the project we're working on is about symmetry. So the scientist in the room suggests we have two doorways, one on either side of the stage. And then, based on that idea, we decide every time a character enters the door on stage left, another character enters the door on stage right. And in that way, symmetry is echoed, and we're telling the story on another level. And that never would have happened if the lighting designer and the scientists hadn't been there at just that moment collaborating alongside us. Everyone's intuition comes into play. It's like a giant jam session. When we use technology in the staging of our plays, we want it to be absolutely crucial to telling the story, not just a special effect. And the only way to know that is to experiment to see what works. In our lab now, we're working on another piece about perception and the brain and the science of consciousness. So one of our grad student collaborators is using Google Dream software to train an artificial neural network to recognize butterflies, their shapes, their patterns, and then to overemphasize that in the resulting images. And this replicates the way our attention shifts in our dreams. Science has given us a fresh perspective on the artistic process, but art also impacts science. During World War II, Hedy Lamarr, who was a movie star in the 30s and 40s, and George Antile patented a secret communication system, as they called it. It was designed to guide radio-controlled torpedoes in water and to make them more difficult for the enemy to detect. So the story goes that Lamar, who, as an actor, understood using her voice in different ways, suggested that when we speak, we're constantly changing frequencies, and that a constantly changing frequency is harder to detect. And Tile had composed for mechanical instruments, including player pianos, and he suggested a mechanism that was based on piano player roles, and that changed across 88 frequencies, taking the number 88 from the number of keys on a piano. Their artistic experience directly impacted their innovation. And although the technology did not exist at the time to implement their work, it later became one of the fundamental elements of cell phone technology. Far less tangible, perhaps, but no less profound, is the way in which the artistic process can contribute to the development of emerging scientists. As one of the very brilliant young scientists working on the DNA folding project put it, Nearly all of us are specialists these days, and that drives a wedge between art and science that prevents each field from adopting the best parts of the other. 
Who knows what astonishing discoveries we'll make by blurring the boundary? It could be a new art form or a new science or a new way of doing both. Because that's where the treasure's to be found, in that exquisite moment in the creative process when the unexpected presents itself and you recognize it and you know you've arrived at something extraordinary. Sometimes the unexpected can be right in front of us. It reminds me of a joke my father used to tell about a guy in a movie theater sitting behind a woman and her dog. Well, throughout the movie, the, the dog's laughing, the dog's crying. I mean, it really seems to be into the movie. So when the movie's over, the man leans forward and, and says to the woman, Ma'am, I, I couldn't help but notice your dog. That's remarkable. I know, she says, isn't it? He hated the book. Thank you very much. <laughs>